Okay. May I have a show of hands? <clears throat> How many people recognize this sentence? Anybody? If I were to add the word pygmy, as in Mbutu pygmies of Zaire, Africa, does this ring a bell to anybody? If I add the word buffalo, okay. This is a very famous story um, from anthropologist Colin Turnbull. The story <clears throat> is of uh, Mr. Turnbull taking a young pygmy native out to the savanna from the forest and ostensibly for the first time seeing um, Farfield and mistaken, mistaking buffalo for insects. Um, uh, this is such a popular story that if you <clears throat> do a Google image search of what insects are those, this is what you get, all about perception. Now, this also is the story of a sophisticated Westerner and a uh, native other um, that's legendary, and Turnbull was very big on the idea of other. A colleague once tried to convince me that Native Africans don't see a V when they look down a road. And I frankly am suspect of a lot of this, not that there isn't some solid perceptual science behind it, but uh, that it's been blown very much out of proportion. And if you read the actual accounts, um, when Turnbull takes Kenji in his Jeep down to the savanna, within an hour he's like, okay, I get it now. Many of you <clears throat> probably recognize this as Dealey Plaza, the site of the JFK assassination. And there are several hundred known photos and several films uh, including the Zapruder film that you may have seen of the JFK assassination. It's long been suggested that if somebody could take all of these images and all of these films and somehow put them together, it would really have to be a labor of love, that you could dimensionalize, convert the 2D to 3D, and see them all together. Uh, there was actually an initiative to get a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab to do this several years ago. Um, there were rights issues with the uh, um, images. But finally, um, this is about two years old, and it's a bootleg copy from the Discovery Channel actually did this. So what I'd like you to watch carefully, and again, it really was a labor of love. It was all done by hand, um, trying to find the positions of all of these images and movies, and then put them together on the clock. So um, keep your eye out for spatial continuity. You know, 30 years later, four years later, this is still kind of chilling to watch. And again, these are images from totally different people that, you know, were meticulously spatialized and lined up. Okay, you can stop there. Um, at the risk of taking two words that are admittedly among contemporary critical theorists um, volatile and putting them together no less, uh, I would like to propose, at least for argument, that a photographic ground to truth does exist. And that we all are probably wired about the same perceptually. And that this makes representing Earth uniquely different than representing uh, in Second Life or World of Warcraft. Um, and that it really is all about representation. Um, which has many meanings. Um, note that in Wikipedia, a lot of them are political. Um, one way to look at this, um, uh, and maybe the word verisimilitude is a more appropriate word here, um, 
is uh, to use a mixing board analogy that if we knew all of the parameters for any sense um, of uh, uh, the elements, and if we had sliders for them, that would be like spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and so on, that if we knew them all, and if we turned all the sliders up to 10, then by definition, the representation would be indistinguishable from the subject. Now, there are industries built around this, like SIGGRAPH, um, and there really is a quest um, for this. Um, if you do not have them all up to 10, which is, by the way, always the case, you have artifacts. Um, and you always have artifacts. Um, it's my observation, uh, this is not theory, this is just observation, that every time the holodeck from Star Trek enters this sort of discourse, things go downhill very, very, very quickly. Um, it's just too far off. Uh, and for those of us working in the trenches, um, it really derails some uh, productive discussion. Um, but it's not really that new. So here is the 1906 stereoscope um, photo, and here's what the back of it says around the world without leaving your home, just like being there. It really is all about artifacts, and if there's one message to take away from this talk, um, is that artifacts are what are most important, and that it's a funny word, because remember that in computer graphics and SIGGRAPH communities, for example, artifacts are considered a bad thing. They're considered those things in the way from verisimilitude, from realness, that we try to get rid of, and an art is considered something good. Um, obviously, this relationship is not simple, and I wish to acknowledge the importance of the complexity. Okay. Um, here is my sort of casual list of the current forms of virtual Earth representation. Uh, there are 2D maps, there are 3D models, geotag photos, I'm going to get into all of these in a moment, um, movie maps, um, panoramics, dimensionalized images, uh, the whole idea of live and telematic and art projects. And if I had to take a first cut at how to organize this, um, this, this is it. And again, this is nothing but a rough pass, just a place to start. Um, and because I'm sure you're familiar with some of these things, I'm going to go pretty quickly through some and uh, longer on others. Okay, maps and models. The most important point that I'd like to make um, is the difference between 2D and 3D and non-semantic and semantic. So that uh, what I mean by semantic is where a machine knows the contents of the image. So um, uh, photos, and for that matter, television is just a bunch of dumb bits, unless a machine, which can't yet, or a person goes in and segments. Similarly, point clouds, which I'll show you in a moment, are often confused with 3D models, uh, but they're nothing but dumb 3D pixels rather than 2D pixels. This is actually an old list, but just to give you an idea of how much activity there is right now in uh, building 3D models of the planet. The race is on, and it's really for the ground view. This is hard. The air looking down is easy. Um, here's one that's been going on at USC. Um, I would hardly say that it looks photographic. Um, uh, the it. Uh, element here is the center bottom is live video that's mapped into this 3D model um, so that elements like people and automobiles uh, don't map right. But it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, Google Earth is uh, mostly an attempt to take 3D and put them on a planar uh, spherical map of the world. And a lot of this information, at least the volume part, is readily available. So for example, the entire uh, country of Japan has the footprints and heights of every building. So if you look carefully, um, the roofs are all flat, but the shape is kind of right. Um, uh, here's a piece of LA that went up maybe a month and a half ago. And you know, Google keeps changing things, and you'll notice that the data is more complex. Where they get it, I don't know, um, actually. Um,
You know, I, let me just go back a second. That's right. Okay, here's a little video of the current state of Google Earth um, in the most developed area. This is Telegraph Hill of San Francisco. And that um, little structure near the bottom is where I lived for many, many years. And um, you can see what they're doing is that they're automatically, um, I'll show it again, um, photographically texturing these surfaces. And it's clearly also that it's automated because it's not a very good job. And there's something both really exciting and really uh, flawed about the state right now. The way Google has been doing a lot of this is by engaging the community to take these photographs and add volumes by hand and then add photographs, um, texture mapping on top of that. Uh, when they began two years ago, they have a warehouse. Um, I typed in USC and there was one hit. And it's, I don't know, some building, USC. Um, today, when you type in USC, you get 299, I think. Um, by the way, can everybody hear me OK? Good, OK, just checking. Um, uh, a couple years ago, when you entered Empire State Building, you'd get over 1,300 entries. And um, if you look at some, this one is by Construction Dude. Um, it's not very accurate. Here's another one a little bit better by Good and Evil 2. Um, and then here's one by Google itself. If you look today, uh, that number has reduced to 290 some. So somebody's going in and actually doing some editing, which is interesting. Okay, photos and geotags. Uh, Flickr, as you know, has a section uh, called Flickr Maps. And just for the record, if you type Empire State Building into Flickr, uh, you get over 100,000 entries. Um, uh, uh, Flickr has over 2 billion images right now. There's something very good about this, I think. Uh, it's open-ended. It's a free-for-all. It's folksonomic organization. Um, uh, it's the freedom that I think makes it work so well. Um, and uh, they have currently uh, over 58 million images that are geotagged of the two over two billion. Panoramio is Google's um, answer. It was acquired uh, by Google a little more than a year ago, and it's like Flickr maps. It's hard to read the total up there. Now you can see it. It's about uh, a little over eight million. And they appear in Google Earth as little blue dots. Um, these, however, are all hand-selected somewhere at the Googleplex. And all eight, 8 million of them. And we did the math on, on how many people must be working on this. But look at the acceptance policy for Google Earth. They will not select photos of people posing, portraits, cars, planes, pets, animals, flowers, close-ups, events. It appears that what they're trying to do is neutralize the world into um, um, sort of picture postcards. And this is very, very much different and the opposite of what Flickr is all about. OK, panoramics and movie maps. I'm clumping them both together because um, panoramics is about looking around, angular motion. Movie maps is about moving around, forward, backward, lateral motion. And they're both fundamentally two-dimensional and non-semantic. Um, there still are people taking or building very, very, very high resolution cameras to take very big images. Um, and they're, I might add, are quite beautiful. But the more common trend has been to tile. The idea is to take a standard digital camera on a tripod, um, maybe a little computerized motor tripod, and zoom, 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 as quick as you can, because most of the people that are doing this do not want artifacts. Important. So they want to get everything before you know, the clouds have changed and people moved and so on. It's important to point out that panoramics are from a single point of view. So the navigation is panning, tilting, and zooming from a single point of view. No moving lateral, uh, which is what movie maps are all about. Um, you probably know that about a year and a half ago, Google released a thing called Street View that not everybody likes, though it's really torn the community. Uh, this is from the front page of the uh, 
uh, Daily Mail in London, Google burglars, charter street cameras. Down at the bottom it says Google or spy car. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of these cars driving around Europe and Asia and the US today. Um, uh, this really all comes back to a project from the late 1970s at MIT, a pre-media lab project called the Aspen Movie Map. Um, I'm actually old enough to have been part of this. Um, the important thing to notice is that we shot one frame every 10 feet triggered by a wheel. And that's why it's not very smooth. But to make it smoother would require more frames. It's as simple as that. We shot every street in town and we shot every turn in town. And again, this is a compromise between visual smoothness and storage. Important. Um, here's an example of Street View, and what I want you to look carefully at is what the transitions from frame to frame look like. Because, again, if you're Google, storage is enough of an issue that you want to shoot, you know, at the largest intervals you possibly can, but, you know, you've got to do something with it. Now, that's kind of cool. But I gotta ask you, are any of those in-between images credible? And the answer is emphatically no. Even if it's kind of cool. Um, here's a competitor called Everyscape. Now you might say, that's really cool. How do they do that? That's even better. But again, by the simple criteria, are any of these in-between transition images um, usable? Th the answer is no, uh, in terms of standalone images. And to make matters even more gnarly, Google, about three months ago, decided to post their street view images inside Google Earth. Um, so what you have are these, you know, kind of spatialized photos inside this 3D model. Um, I actually, I know that, that street, and I can tell you that it doesn't look like that. <laughs> you know, there aren't these cylinders there. To integrate those photographic images with the 3D model is, especially in an automated way, is a really complicated uh, process. Um, I'm lumping re-photography and dimensionalization together. They both deal with converting 2D to 3D. But I really have to give a strong acknowledgement to re-photography. Um, there's a Wikipedia entry, and these people to me are the best, the third view uh, people. Watch carefully as they dissolve from one to the other. And I've met these people. They're not like computer scientists. Um, and if you mention the computer vision term, for getting the camera in the exact right place, finding the pose. They don't know about that. They wear hiking boots all the time. And they're just really, really talented at knowing where to stand, what lens to use, and where to point. And um, I, I truly don't believe that there's any Photoshop involved here. Uh, these are very dedicated people. Um, here's a modest, simple little study I did in 2002. And um, it might look like there's more going on than there really is. Anybody can do this um, with a camera, uh, a tripod, and Photoshop. And of course, the trick is that the, the camera didn't move a micron um, in, in terms of both where it was pointing and its position so that everything perfectly aligns. This is a critical sort of idea. Um, and of course, you can add stuff. You can imagine um, a bunch of these circles moving around and having some kind of hyper real, real image, which I think is an exciting direction. Um, dimensionalization is related. It's a very, very hot topic. Um, this is what Photosynth released less than three months ago. Um, did I say Photosynth? Oh, what Microsoft released um, called Photosynth. And um, uh, the claim, I believe, is noble. It's for all the world's images to be able to be spatialized together in one model. And they're hell-bent that it is an automated process. And you see the number 83% synthy. That means that their automated process did not uh, uh, 
couldn't adapt to the remaining 17%. Um, according to their published research, when they take arbitrary flicker images of like Grand Canal and Vaporetto, um, um, they, the, the synthiness on average is about 20%. Um, and as exciting as this is, there's something that I find fundamentally objectionable in that it's having the technology determine what, what, what goes and what doesn't. Um, that's a point cloud model behind it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's great for certain applications. And if you know what you're doing and you shoot everything at the same time of day with no foreground you know, people and stuff like this, oddly, like the Panoramio acceptance policy, um, They'll, they'll be able to process quite nicely. Um, and again, this might look cool, but it hardly looks real in the sense of verisimilitude. And it's ironic that this is, you know, Microsoft trying to give us more reality. Um, here's a project um, that I was involved in that we recently launched at USC. Um, there was a collaboration between the Institute of Creative Technologies Computer Science Group and uh, the Interactive Media Division of the Film School. Um, we nicknamed it How to Seamlessly Flickerize Google Earth. And the idea is very, very simple. Um, anybody's photo can be positioned in a 3D model with a little bit of human help. And this drives the Google and Microsoft people crazy. But with a little bit of human help, um, and we specify under one minute, 10 year old can do it, um, it opens up the playing field to any and all images. Um, partway through the project, one of my partners was walking through the bank parking lot and took a picture down um, of his foot and uh, the parking line. And to me, this is incredible. This is like, says sort of the spirit of what we're doing. Um, this image is not a picture postcard image. It has no personal meaning perhaps to anybody but him and maybe his friends. And it's a perfectly aligned uh, photograph that somebody took with Google, you know, an image taken from the air. Okay, the only point I want to make about live and telematics is that it's entirely unprecedented. Um, live, the concept, did not exist before electronic communication. And again, back to Google, who's been trumping everyone, um, in July, they announced uh, that they had somehow found and posted on Google Earth 5,000 live webcams. Um, some total surprise to all of us. It was a stealth effort. Um, they appear like this. Um, today, if you can read, bottom left, it's up to over 6,000. Um, telematics is a broader issue than simply live video. And some of you may remember that in 2001, curator Steve Dietz organized a traveling show uh, called Telematic Connections, uh, the virtual embrace. And it was largely historical. And we think that this is just the beginning. Um, I've been invited to direct a project for Linz09 and Ars Electronica next year called 80 plus 1, A Journey Around the World. That's a telematic redo of Jules Verne around the world in 80 days. And what we have right now, and I'm asking you to spread the word, is an open call for proposals for what we're calling live bits art exploring real-time connectedness. Any bandwidth, any modality. The deadline is this coming end of month, October 31st. We are giving out up to 20 10,000 euro commissions for this. That's like 20 uh, golden nikas. And we will notify the recipients one month after the deadline on November 30th. Um, so we're spreading the word and I have time. Uh, a couple days ago, um, uh, we got an entry. I, I'm going to have to anonymize this a little bit, but it was from someone in Mali who grew up in a village where their most difficult uh, daily task is getting water. And there's only, it's because there's only one pump in the village. 
and she happens to have an engineering degree. And the village happens to have a um, internet cafe that opened recently, so she's proposing um, some kind of live instrumentation of this pump. How cool is that? I, I, this is just incredible. And um, I, I'm, we expect that a lot of the entries that we get will be site specific, but a lot of them won't be. As you know, there, there's a great deal of activity with the say haptics and ambient audio and stuff like that. Um, some of which requires big pipes, but a lot of it can be done for, you know, you can rent an Iridium satellite phone for like 50 euros a month. They're good anywhere in the world. And it's not a lot of bandwidth, but I'm, you know, banking on the creative community stepping up for the call here. So the deadline is October 31st. Okay, end of shameless pitch. Positive artifacts in the hyperreal. Here's something that my students did several years ago um, in LA, and it's, a, it's tiling, like the one I showed earlier, but guess what? They didn't want no artifacts. They wanted to embrace the artifacts because they wanted to do something that was more artistic. Um, so things like this were intentional, and having repeated people were intentional. Um, Hyperreal. Uh, Art plus com, the invisible shape of things past 1995 to 2007. Oliver showed this. Uh, Jeffrey Shaw's Place a User Manual, 1995. Um, similarly, a group out of the Netherlands called 360 Cities um, doing these 360 orb-like things. Um, they're currently in Google Earth. Um, Masaki Fujihata's fieldwork, Alsace, um, and here's a, a short video, just to give you an idea. And clearly, uh, Masaki's intention was not verisimilitude here. Um, and what's so ironic is that the folks at Microsoft and at Google are totally interested in this stuff and really haven't a clue. Um, uh, it, it's partly the disconnect between the art and the research community, I'm afraid. Um, so here we have Microsoft under the category of hyperreal um, uh, unintentionally. Here we have Google under the category of hyperreal unintentionally. They're trying for real space verisimilitude. So let's go back to Dealey Plaza and imagine if something like this were to happen today or maybe in five years in the future. And let's lighten it up a little and say that it's not something tragic, but it's some really interesting event. Everyone's going to have internet-connected GPS cameras and video. Um, it will all be able to be merged in some form. Will people do visual hacks, especially if it's a planned, important event? Maybe even in groups like conspiracies where they all, you know, like hack something in. I, I hope so. Um, several years ago at the San Francisco Film Festival, um, some filmmakers presented their film of um, some Tariq camel drivers. And they claimed that the Tariq subjects in their film had never seen photographs. This is the late 90s. Never seen photographs before. And um, they left before I could confront them on this because I frankly did not believe that. But I did uh, run into Peter Scarlett, the festival director, the next day. And I told him the story and Peter smiled and he said, yeah, yeah that happened a couple years ago. Um, there were filmmakers working with three African teenagers you know, sadly, it's always African, Native African. And um, they claimed that um, they'd never seen photographs before. And they later found out that these three African teenagers were actually Werder Herzog fans. And they were just pulling a number on the filmmakers. Um, these days of the sophisticated white man um, and the other in a Jeep alone, um, those days are gone. They're, they're over. Um, the uh, uh, global connectedness is at the speed of light. And what this says to me is that 
the issue of how to confront image naivete today is best done by us looking at our community. Thank you.